Now, author and journalist Leslie Ann Jones certainly knows a thing or two about 1970s music legends. Freddie Mercury, David Bowie, the Rolling Stones, Leslie Ann knew them all. And as a successful music biographer for over 25 years, she's published eight books and has just delivered her ninth, Fly Away Paul, delving into the evolution of Paul McCartney's career in Wings and as a solo artist. Believe it or not, the 50th anniversary of the classic Wings album Band on the Run is fast approaching, and Leslie Ann's book digs deep into that time in Paul's life. We'll hear from Leslie Ann after this very short little song. Now, that's a little 45-second love thing about uh, Linda Eastman, which I guess could have become a full song, but it never was. So that's a song that didn't quite make it as a full song. And joining me now is Leslie Ann Jones, author of Fly Away Paul, How McCartney Survived the Beatles, Found His Wings, and Became a Solo Superstar. Leslie Ann, a very good afternoon. Hey, Johnny, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. And yourself? Good, thank you. Now, a little love song which could have developed into a whole song, but never did. Yeah, everything was from that stage on. It was about Linda, wasn't it? She saved his life, I think. uh, He was very, very lucky to meet her at a time when the Beatles were falling apart, which effectively they were doing from about late 1966 onwards. But by September 69... uh, John was married to Yoko, Paul was married to Linda Eastman, and so they both had a future. And I think Paul very much fixated on his future with Linda, his family, uh, all the possibilities of, of restoring things in his life that he didn't have before she came along. So Linda and Yoko actually arrived at their marriages, their potential marriages, with a little girl under one arm. Um, Linda had her daughter, Heather, and, and Yoko had Kyoko. Paul's focus from from then on was all Linda, and I think pretty much all the love songs he wrote going forwards till the day she died were about her. Now, if uh, John Lennon had not met Yoko Ono, and if Paul McCartney had not met Linda Eastman, would the Beatles still have broken up? Yeah, it's a good question. I think they would have. It was very fashionable to blame them, wasn't it, all those years? I address this in the book, and I, I, I say, you know, I think actually probably Linda and Yoko did break up the Beatles. The Beatles were breaking up anyway, and the fact was that John and Paul just wanted to spend time with their their woman much more than they wanted to hang with those boys anymore. It was just a process of growing. Now, reading your book, one realises that the breakup of the Beatles was much more traumatic for, well, for both of them, but certainly for Paul. And he kind of needed his partner, John, and he was not there anymore. And he sunk into a bit of a depression. And, uh, of course, he grew a beard. The, f- the famous thing is when you're in a depression, this is for blokes, <laughs> you don't want to get out of bed. And if you m- do manage to get out of bed, you certainly can't be bothered to shave. And uh, it was so true. <laughs> it, is. it was Linda that saved the day as Paul McCartney put it in the song every night Paul McCartney and every night from his first solo album on the line Leslie Ann Jones author of Fly Away Paul uh, a new book about McCartney after the Beatles now um, what was the reaction from the critics and the press to that first solo album well, I think they hated it. and I know they hated it. And all anybody wanted at that stage was the Beatles again. So anything that Paul could put out, which in this case was a sort of homespun album, wasn't it? With, with him with a little recording machine at home, finished off in the studio up the road later on. But, but something that indicated he was trying so hard to push the Beatles away, to get away from that era and to do something new and to express himself and express his love for this amazing woman who'd come into his life. I really loved the album. I thought it was great. As did Neil Young, apparently, according to your book. Yeah, he did. It's, uh, I think everybody envied, including other rock stars, Neil Young being a prime example, that uh, 
Paul had clearly found something that everybody craves. And he was able to write about it. And it's so two whammies, you know. It's there's a lot to envy in Paul McCartney, even at that very frail stage in his life. Now and he famously bought a little farm in Scotland, and sometimes uh, musicians would go up there because they'd do recordings up there. And of course, the musicians would have expected, "Well, it's Paul McCartney. It's going to be a lovely place, be nice and warm, be fantastic." That's not what they found, was it? No, not at all. It's actually a really big farm. I went there in November. It's on the Kintyre Peninsula. The Mall of Kintyre actually is not a place, but we all think it's a place because of the song. And that, so the Mall is the very tip of the peninsula where there's a lighthouse. Um, but they wrote the song about this place, and one of the, the Scottish musicians I interviewed said to me, it depends on where you are as to where it is, which I thought was brilliant. But he, there was this ramshackle old house that had been there for donkey's ears with with an outside loo and uh, no heating inside, not really running water, no furniture. They had to make beds out of you know pallets and bits of wood, and, and Paul was driving a tractor during the day and knocking beds together at night and they had rats in the walls and mice running around and they were up there the first time with a newborn baby which was Mary and uh, Heather's uh, sorry Linda's daughter Heather and Paul just took to his bed as you mentioned and stopped shaving stopped getting up and she was uh, a wife of only seven months a young woman saying what am I supposed to do with this but gradually over time she said you know we can make this place something and it was all at her instigation all her energy and they restored the house they had another ramshackle building just down down the hill there where i've been inside actually where they did record uh, many tracks in there including mull of Kintyre. and that it's still laid out as a recording studio but uh, some people live inside that now but yeah it's very remote the people leave you alone campbelltown is is one of those places where you think somewhere like this doesn't really exist and yet i'm here and you can imagine what those musicians, the, the members of Wings, other session guys, thought of this place when they first arrived. This is the end of the earth. There's nothing for us here. Now, why did Paul McCartney decide to form a band and not pursue a solo career? That was Linda's idea again, when he was uh, being the big baby lying in the bed. And she said to him, you know, you've got to get out. You've got to get back on the horse. You need to be in another band. And he said, well, I can't do that. I'm not doing that unless you do it with me. And she's never played an instrument in her life. She'd never sung anything beyond a school choir. And yet she was persuaded that she would do that for him. She would put herself up for ridicule, which she certainly got, and be in a band with her husband just to get him back up there and doing it. And that, I thought, was an enormous sacrifice. There were all those jokes kicking around, weren't there? What do you call a dog with wings? Linda McCartney. It was shocking abuse that she took at that time. But he didn't yet have the confidence to launch himself as a solo artist, which led me to believe that Wings, the, the decade that was Wings, between the Beatles and his solo career, were his training ground to become a solo superstar. Yeah, talking of the criticism that Linda got, I remember Mick Jagger saying, what on earth is his wife doing in the band? You know, when I go to concerts, that's work. You don't take your wife to the office. He got a lot of criticism, Paul, and also did Linda. And I remember hearing at the time, well, you know, they Linda's singing backing vocals, but they fade her mic down on the mixing desk. Was that true or was that just a myth? I think we can hear on the recordings that they didn't do that. You know, she actually sings some very beautiful backing vocals and her voice is very strong and, and it contrasts really beautifully with Paul's and, and with Danny Lane's. Um, they had a good little trio thing going there. I don't think we can shame her for that. Now, you mentioned a trio, the other person, of course, being Danny Lane. And other people that did join the band of uh, Wings, they didn't get paid very much, did they? Paul was not exactly... Uh, you know, handing out the cash. Well, I think it was 70 quid a week each at one point. Four drummers over time, three guitarists. I think Paul probably saw them as, as less members of the band, more session guys. The band was Paul and Linda. And even Danny Lane didn't 
get what he felt he deserved. And there was a lot of rankling and ire about that over the years. But I think only in hindsight does Paul see Wings as banned. I think he didn't really see it as a band at the time. It was him and Linda and then a bunch of guys that they hired. Then famously, Paul decided to go out on the road uh, in a van with the family, with the instruments, take it back to basics and go around universities and just turn up and offer to play. Is it true one university turned them down, said, no, sorry, we don't want you playing? (laughs) I think quite a lot of universities must have turned them down. I mean, the thing against them was that he refused to have anything to do with Beatles music during that period of time. That was a line drawn under those years, and he wasn't going to revisit any of that. Of course, wings were an unknown quantity. So why does anybody want to hear a bunch of songs by a musician who's considered very passe at that time? You know, Paul McCartney, so what? Things moved on very quickly in the 70s, didn't they? Then there there was that great album, Band on the Run, a brilliant album, about to celebrate its 50th anniversary. And they went to Lagos in Nigeria to record that. The band kind of disbanded on the tarmac, didn't they? I think the night before, phone calls were fielded and people dropped out and refused to go. And in the, I mean, first of all, who wants to go to Lagos to record an album? EMI had studios in in strange, far-flung places around the world. And Paul was just interested in recording somewhere new. So he virtually stuck a pin in the map. And do you want to go to Nigeria to record an album? And of course, if you're only getting 70 quid a week to do something like that, why should you go, you know? So it did wind down to just Paul and Linda and Denny Lane producing that album. And they arrived in Lagos with the family and with a couple of demo tapes of songs they'd worked up. And one night they made the mistake of trying to walk back from this ramshackle studio and they got stopped on the road by a bunch of ne'er-do-wells uh, who looked as though they might actually kill them, uh, having robbed of them. And Linda was screaming at them, he's Paul McCartney, he's a beetle, please don't touch him. Uh, but what they did make off with was all their money, their wallets, their cameras, bits and pieces, and the demo tapes. So they escaped with their lives but had to come up with the songs all over again. I think they got off lightly, actually. Well, Paul didn't know a way of making life hard for yourself. Then it's even more incredible that they produced such a great album. Oh, it's immense. It's where I came in. I mean, this this is why I've written this book. It occurred to me that the 50th anniversary of Band on the Run was this year, and I thought, well, that that's where I started musically. I'd love to revisit those years and really re-examine the effect that those seven albums, all those amazing songs had on me at that time compared to how I feel about them now. Paul McCartney and Wings and Band on the Run. And so we bring it right up to date, really, and Paul McCartney learned his chops, really, uh, during the Wings years and has got an incredible solo career. And the highlight was Glastonbury, really, wasn't it? Oh, it was unbelievable. I just, I cried all the way through. I didn't go to Glastonbury. I haven't gone to Glastonbury for a very long time. I wouldn't want to stand there in that crowd. I had to watch it on television on my own. I was thrilled and afraid. I was afraid that he wouldn't do it right, but, but knowing that he would win over that crowd incredibly because that is him. He is a genius. And it was so emotional, the whole thing. He just celebrated his 80th birthday and he walks out there like a 23-year-old looking slim and fit and dapper and welcoming on his special guests like Dave Grohl and Bruce Springsteen. I didn't dare watch it a second time in case it wasn't as good. (laughs) Just before you go, if I had to ask you to pick what you consider to be the best Paul McCartney or Wings song, which would it be? Without question, maybe I'm amazed. The love song he wrote for Linda, um, the love song that we can all take to our hearts. It's, it expresses everything. It's never been battered, and I defy anybody to say that it's no good. Well, congratulations on another amazing book, Leslie Ann, and uh, thanks for being with us this afternoon. Thank you for having me, Johnny.
There it is, the song that Leslie Ann Jones considered the finest that Paul McCartney has ever done. It's called Maybe I'm Amazed, and it's from his first solo album. Leslie Ann Jones' book, Fly Away Paul, How McCartney Survived the Beatles, Found His Wings, and Became a Solo Superstar, is out now.